All right, hey there, everybody. This is Rebecca Smetana. Thank you for being here for our September SCO webinar that is all about strengthening your application for admission to optometry school. We're going to dive right in head first. I'd like to introduce Mike Robertson, who is Director of Admissions and Enrollment Services. He has been working here in the admissions office for many years. So he knows all the ins and outs of the application process. He is heavily involved in making decisions in regards to who gets interview invitations here and is here for all the interviews we host on campus. So needless to say, very, very knowledgeable about this topic and we'll be able to give you a lot of really great information. So we'll go through some information, of course, along the way. Feel free to plop in whatever questions you have into the webinar system. There is a chat box and a question and answer box that I'll keep an eye on. And if we don't get to your question as we go, we'll make sure to get to it at the end. Without any further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to Mike. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us. And I hope this uh, will be informative and helpful. And some of it's going to be a repeat, I'm sure, of what you've heard before, but I think it's, it's, it's worth uh, repeating uh, to give you the insight that uh, you need in order to uh, become a, uh, a better applicant. So the first thing we've got up is it's just some common questions. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna go through those a little quickly and we'll expand upon some of them uh, as we go through the, the presentation. Uh, so what do we look for in applicants and what things are important? Well, I'm gonna tell you uh, what I told a panel of students one time at a seminar, and that is the OAT and the GPA are top priority. Uh, schools will tell you sometimes they look at the entire applicant, which we do, but I don't think there's a, a school out there, a health profession school out there that has said, okay, we're gonna take a 1.8 uh, applicant because they uh, participated a lot in extracurricular activities or they worked or whatever. So your OAT and GPA are always going to be important. Now, with that said, your background, extracurricular, shadowing especially, those are also very important. You can't live life in a vacuum, so we don't do that in the admissions process. But if you don't have a, a, a good GPA or a good OAT to balance a lower GPA, then it's going to be tough. So those are the two biggest things that we look at. And then from that point forward, we look at your entire application. Uh, to say what's more important, the OAT or the GPA, it's hard to say, but I can tell you this, we have some unwritten uh, bottom lines at SCO. For an OAT, it's been many, many years since we've interviewed anyone with an OAT below 300. Not saying that we won't at some point, but the 300 is the 50th percentile, and we just haven't dipped below that in 20 years or more. Um, the GPA, uh, even though the average hovers around 3.5 to 3.6, I would say we've admitted a 265 in the last five years or so, but anybody below a three point generally has to have an OAT that is closer to the average. So the one candidate I'm thinking of that had a two, I think he had a 268 or a 275, was a 340 or a 350 on the OAT. He had lots of great shadowing. He had a great uh, professional demeanor. Uh, so all the other things came into play in that situation. Obviously, not many candidates with a GPA below three point are being admitted or our average would be lower than it is. So, but to say which one is more important is difficult. There just has to be some balance. If the OAT is lower, you need a higher GPA. If the GPA is lower, you need a higher OAT. Uh, as regarding a retake of the OAT, we have a standard answer. If I get an application in the vast majority of cases, that person has a 300, I usually recommend a retake. Could they be admitted? Could you be admitted with a 300? Certainly you could, but you're going to want your total science score to be at least 300, and that's got to be a company with a GPA that's going to be higher than a 3.0. Uh, as far as retaking courses, I usually leave that up to the candidate. 
if you made a C or a D, certainly if you made an F, you have to, but if you made a C or a D, sometimes you have a course that you don't make the best grade, but you absolutely learn a great deal about it and feel like you did master it. If that's the case, I don't think it's necessary to retake. If you have five Ds, yeah, you're gonna to need to retake some of those. So everything has to be looked at individually. Uh, let's say you made a, a C or a D in physics one and two, and you made a 250. Yeah, you're gonna probably need to retake that test or take the uh, course again. Uh, and the test would just depend on your, your overall average. How much shadowing should you have before applying? When I get an application, I literally count up the hours I see that an applicant lists. If an applicant lists anything fewer than 25 hours, I usually write him or her and say, why don't you complete some more before we look at your application again? Our standard rule of thumb is 30 to 45 hours, and that should be spread over a minimum of two to three settings. And that doesn't mean 30 hours in each setting. That means a total. But one thing I will tell you is if you do the minimum, I'm gonna consider you having a C in your shadowing. It's just like in a class, if you do the minimum to pass, it's usually considered a C, um, maybe a D, uh, but the minimum means you just did as little as you could. So that's why we always say go above and beyond uh, what we request. And then extracurriculars, uh, I think you have to add in there how important are extracurricular activities or work. If you work 20 or more hours a week, you're just not going to have as much time for extracurriculars. If you don't work at all, you have plenty of time for them. So again, there's got to be a little balance there. Um, but I can tell you this, the extracurriculars that get you involved, meeting people, having to, con to talk to people, converse with people, those are great activities because it gets you used to dealing with the public and that's what you're going to do in, in any healthcare uh, setting. As far as the application process, uh, the OAT, most people are applying between the end of their junior year and the, and the beginning of their senior year. And for most people, that is the summer in between those two. And that's when we recommend taking the OAT. By that point, you should have had all the prereqs that are going to be on the test. Remember, biochem and micro are not on the OAT. So you could take those in your senior year. But if you've had all of the prerequisites, the physics, the gen chems, the organic, et cetera, taking that test late spring or during the summer uh, between junior and senior year should give you plenty of time to prepare and then Let's just say you don't make a great score, it gives you time for a retake. OptumCast will begin taking applications July 1, sometimes it's June 28th, but somewhere around there. Uh, a couple of keys about that process. One, do not send any transcripts until you have initiated a file. If they get a transcript before your file is initiated, they literally will shred it and get rid of it. So wait until you open up that uh, application, then you can request, and you must have a transcript from every college for which you have received credit. So that means if you took dual enrollment courses in high school or you uh, took a course in the summer at a community college, they must have that original transcript. Um, the other thing that goes along with that transcript uh, is OptumCast will offer you an opportunity to use, I believe they call it professional transcript entry. Do not use it. Um, they want, I don't know how much it costs, $60, $70. And what they're going to do is do what you could do probably in half the time. They're going to enter your own, your coursework, whereas if you enter it, you're gonna get it done quicker. They're gonna wait and put you in line behind whoever was in front of you. That can sometimes take weeks. Whereas if you get copies of your transcripts, put them in front of you, simply enter the information. It, it can't take more than a couple of hours, I would think at the most, you know, give or take. Uh, for the letters of reference, same thing, don't have those letters sent before you open a file. In fact, when you open the file, there will be a spot for you to indicate who you will have sending letters of reference. You will have to give an email address. 
So my advice is to contact whoever you're going to have send references, let them know they're going to get an email requesting an electronic submission of a, a reference letter. We require at least one from an optometrist who is not a relative and whom you have uh, shadowed or worked with. And the second one is your pre-health professions advisor, or let's say you're an English major. Sure, you can have your English professor send a letter, but we need a science letter also. So if your major is outside of the sciences, then you're going to certainly need a letter from either a physics, biology, or chemistry professor who has given you a grade uh, in a course. Uh, as far as the shadowing and extracurricular activities, I believe that section is called experiences. Do not skip it. I often have to write a candidate and say, hey, you didn't list any extracurriculars, you didn't list any employment, uh, so I don't know if you've done anything or not. Uh, sometimes candidates will forget to even list the shadowing. They may have mentioned it in their essay, but if they don't list it, then we can't uh, really make a good assessment. So make sure you're listing that. Once you have an OptomCast ID, you can come to our website and submit our supplemental ap uh, application and the $50 fee. When we get the supplemental, we start corresponding with you. When we get the OptomCast file, whether that's at the same time as the supplemental or later, we will write you and tell you what we believe um, is, uh, if, let me put it this way, we will write you and tell you if anything is missing, if there's anything we think you can do to strengthen your file. And that is based simply on our years of experience on what makes a candidate successful. So uh, do not be offended if you get an email from me that says, hey, I think you should shadow 10 more hours or I think you really ought to retake the test. That's just basing me giving you advice that I think will, will help you be successful. But once OptomCast has verified your file, which means audited it and checked off on it, then you're eligible to be invited for an interview by any school or college of optometry. You do not have to have letters of reference on file for that to occur. So don't get caught in this web of waiting on uh, a slow reference to be admitted before you submit your file. You're, you're only holding yourself up at that point. Uh, submit the file once you have written your essay, once you have entered all the grades, uh, and really that's it. The transcripts, they can't verify your file without the transcripts, but they at least have your file ready to go when the transcripts arrive. Uh, we're going to make an assessment when a file is verified, if the candidate is strong enough to come for an interview, and then we will uh, send you an invitation. Uh, one key about that invitation, uh, a lot of candidates think, oh, well, if I don't apply in July, I'll get it done in August or September. And just to give you an idea, uh, what's today, September 17th, if you finished your file today, it was verified today, and I reviewed it, the earliest we could probably get you here is November 15th. We are booked solid until that point. So you can never forget that there's a gap between you finishing your file and the interview. Now, sometimes it's not that long of a gap. If you finished your file on July the 15th, I might be able to get you here on August 15th. Um, but if you're finishing it later, it can sometimes take six, eight weeks before we can get you here for an interview. And during that six to eight weeks, um, depending on what time of year it is, we could have uh, given out all the scholarship money. If you're from a contract state, we may have awarded all the contracts. If uh, it's later in the year, we may have awarded all the seats for the class period. So you always have to backtrack a minimum of four weeks and probably more. So if you're submitting on September 1, you need to realize that it's going to be into October before anything probably uh, happens. There is a quick question about letters of reference. Some schools require a letter from a pre-health committee. Does SCO? We do not require a committee because some schools don't have one. If you have a committee letter, we certainly accept it. And if that committee letter includes 
a letter from an optometrist, uh, we can accept that for the OD letter and the advisor letter. Okay, becoming a competitive applicant. Again, these uh, some of this is a repeat, uh, but <laughs> you, we think sometimes we've said it till uh, people hate us, but uh, then we always had the candidates who didn't listen. So taking that OAT early, uh, applying. I always tell a candidate, if you're from a state that provides tuition assistance, a contract state, you really need to get that application in here in July or August. Um, it's just very competitive for those seats. Uh, submit the uh, supporting documentation, meaning your transcripts to OptomCast, the letters of reference to OptomCast. Um, becoming familiar with the profession. When you come for an interview, you're going to be interviewed by an optometrist, and you're going to be interviewed by an optometrist on faculty who cares very much about his or her profession. So you can't come into this going, okay, I shadowed 30 hours and so I know enough. Uh, you can't say, okay, I got invited, that means I'm in the door. No, I can give you stories uh, right and left about candidates with great numbers who didn't do enough to learn about the profession and either didn't get admitted or we had to hold their file, tell them to go back and shadow more. So try to find out about the profession and that means, you know, if you live in state A, what you can do in state A could be totally different than what an optometrist can do in state B, and you should understand that process. Talk to your optometrist uh, about the laws in the state and what they're allowed to do. Uh, and then the commitment to service. It is so very important. When we talk about extracurriculars, that's really what we're talking about. Um, one, it's what we should all do for our fellow brothers and sisters. And two, we're going to make you do it here. You can't graduate without completing uh, a certain number of hours of service. It is our eventual goal to offer students the opportunity to graduate with service honors. Right now you can graduate, graduate with academic honors, but one day we hope to have service honors. So starting that now gets you prepared. It also just like I said earlier about employment, it also helps you to get ready to deal with patients. Uh, this may come as a shock to a lot of candidates, but all your patients are not going to be uh, strictly uh, average, normal people. Uh, you're going to get people, uh, and we're going to we're going to make you at SCO. We're going to give you people with mental challenges, with uh, disabilities. Uh, people who speak different languages, those are all people who deserve proper health care and who help you to become a better health care provider. So participating in service is very important. It doesn't have to be optometric service. Certainly that's nice, but maybe your thing is helping uh, at the animal shelter. That's great. You're committing uh, a service that's helping your fellow citizens. Uh, or Habitat for Humanity or whatever. So uh, make sure you have done something along those lines. And where that really becomes important is when we're breaking ties and when we're deciding on uh, scholarship awards. So let's just say we have a 3.7, 350, and both of them have pretty much the same numbers, pretty much same experience, but one did no service and the other one had uh, a great deal of service. The one with more service is going to get a higher amount of a scholarship. So keep that in mind. Uh, and when we say ask questions, we mean uh, that in a manner of serious questions. We don't mean call us just to see what the weather's like. We mean when you don't know which course to take or you're unsure about uh, the total number of practices you should shadow, uh, you don't know a timeline, those are things you must ask us because what we tell you can uh, end up uh, saving you uh, money uh, or help get you a seat uh, in the class. There's a, uh, just an idea of what this class that just started a few weeks ago, what they uh, look like. You will see that we have uh, increased our GPA average and OAT average to school records. Generally, the GPA is around a 3.5, uh, 
Uh, we went over that this year, and generally the OET is around 330, and you see it went up. Uh, no candidates in this class are coming in without a bachelor's degree or higher. You can apply uh, after your sophomore year and enroll after your junior year if you have uh, the numbers in the file that uh, sustain that. And when I say the numbers, you're looking at them right now. If you try to be admitted with a 3.2 and a 320, it's probably not going to happen. Uh, the other thing is that bachelor's degree is, to me, very important in building your practice. You then have uh, another diploma, quite frankly, uh, to demonstrate your level of, of knowledge. You, uh, If you want to teach in the future, if you want to work maybe for uh, the military, there's lots of entities that are going to give a lot of credence to a bachelor's degree. So to me, it's silly, quite frankly, to go three years of college uh, and not go on and finish that fourth year. With that said, we sometimes have one or two in a class who had outstanding files uh, and we did admit them without uh, a degree. Okay, there it is one more time. Apply early in multiple sequences. Uh, one year in advance, the best time being in the summer. And again, go back to that scenario of, okay, you get me your application October 15th. Well, we may not be able to get you in an interview until January. And usually by January, we're pushing 100 deposits, if not more. We enroll 136. So you've now narrowed down your chances to 36 out of however many more candidates we're going to uh, interview. Um, the uh, the timeline is pretty much accurate. You know, sometimes things are not going to fall exactly like that. Uh, sometimes I hear candidates go, everything's finished but my essay. You know, I'm not going to uh, try to say the essay is not important because it is. Uh, but there haven't been many candidates we de declined or rejected because their essay wasn't the best. Uh, now, that doesn't mean you can have typos and poor grammar and poor sentence structure, et cetera, but it's not worth delaying your file two months because you continue to have multiple people review it, multiple people advise you. It's not that big of a component. Uh, do we want it to be uh, thoughtful and reflective of who you are as a person? Yes. Do we want you to regurgitate what you told me under the experiences section? No, I can read that separately. So give us some insight, but don't make your file be delayed uh, because of an essay. Same thing with the OAT. Some candidates think they can't apply until they've had the OAT. No, not at all. In fact, I would say if you're going to apply, you're taking the OAT in August, you should make every effort to finish your file before you take the OAT. That way, when you do take the test, you can send me the score report, and if you're a competitive candidate, we can invite you right away. Whereas if you do the opposite and you uh, take the OAT and then you work on your OptomCast application, you've just delayed it another month or so. So just let us know when you apply, we ask you two questions about the OAT. Have you had it? Do you plan to retake it? Uh, and if you, you haven't had it, but you know you're going to take it approximately October 1, just put October 1. Uh, that way we know when to look for a score. Uh, so always, always prepare in advance and you won't get too far behind. Okay, OAT and GPA. This is a pretty good example here. Uh, we say 320 and above. And when the score comes in around 310, sometimes with a 310, I don't recommend to retake. That's usually when the candidate has at least a 310 in total science. And in some cases, we'll have a higher score in total science. Um, but that is kind of, a, like I said, a standard procedure for us. The competitive range on the GPA, 3.0. You heard me give an example of someone uh, who's had below a 3.0. 
and was admissible. We tell you on our website uh, and in our publications, if you have below a 2.5 to contact us, uh, and the reason we do that is to tell you in advance that it's very difficult to be admitted. Honestly, I can't remember in my 20 years, certainly in the last 12 years, I can't remember any candidate with a 2.5 being admitted. Um, I mean, it's, I'm not going to say it's not possible, but it would be very difficult. Um, for the prerequisites, um, just like we said before, do you need to retake it if you made a C or a D? It depends. Uh, a lot of things, quote, depend in the application process. It's just like withdrawing. A candidate may ask me, is it going to hurt me if I withdraw from a class? No, you withdraw from one class, <clears throat> excuse me, that's not a big deal. But if your transcript is peppered with W's, then there's an issue. Because when you come to optometry school, you cannot drop a course. There's no such thing. So let's say you get into the first semester and you go, wow, this anatomy is really hard. I'm going to drop it. Did that can occur. Uh, you have to finish that course. If you fail it, then you go before a committee to determine uh, if you're allowed to stay in school, but there is no dropping of a course uh, at the professional school level. So an undergrad, if we see that you've done that multiple times, then we're worried that there's a pattern going on that you just simply get overloaded, can't pass a course, and you get out of it. So W's can be uh, bad. Uh, some, and I don't mean when you have a family emergency and you have to withdraw from school. That's not what I'm referring to. I'm talking about multiple semesters of dropping a course. Okay, here we go with the, the biggie, the shadowing. Um, when we say 30 to 45 hours, again, we don't mean in each place. But when we say three modes of practice, what we're talking about there is uh, let's say a private practice that has one optometrist working, and he probably has a, an assistant and a receptionist or whatever. That, a private practice would be one mode. Uh, a partnership where there's two, three, or four optometrists working together, that could be a, considered a second type of practice. A practice that's commercial, like Lens Crafters or Pearl or Walmart, that's a third type of practice. A fourth might be, uh, strictly an ophthalmologist office, although we prefer you find an office that has ophthalmologist and optometrist working together, but that would be a fourth. If you can get in a hospital, some hospitals, children's hospitals, VA hospitals, have optometry clinics in them. Uh, if you have a connection to a military base and can shadow at a military base, there's another type. Uh, there can be something like we have in Memphis, the, the Church Health Center, which is a, a place for the working poor to come for health care. And in there, there's dentistry, optometry, and general medicine. That's another place. So there's lots of different choices uh, for you to, uh, to shadow in. And the best place to start is whoever you have for your own personal optometrist. Uh, if you've got a good relationship with them, ask them, can you shadow? And when we say shadow, we don't mean just sit at the front desk. Uh, you really need a doctor who's going to allow you to go into the exam room with her or him and follow what they're doing. Uh, some optometrists will have a teaching tube where you can look in and see exactly what they're saying when they dilate their patient and they're looking in the, uh, the backs of their eyes. So. Uh, Get into as many as possible. It doesn't have to be 15, 15, and 15 hours. You might get five in one place. You might get 20 in the next. Um, it's just cumulative. Uh, you want to get as much as you can. And to let you know, you will compete against candidates with hundreds and hundreds and some with thousands of hours. Uh, does that automatically get them in the door? No, of course not. But those are candidates who know the profession well. Uh, and again, if it comes to a tiebreaker, same numbers, uh, but one has lots more experience, that person might get the nod over you for 
uh, a seat late in the game or for a scholarship. So you want to learn it as much as you can. And then also not just uh, about optometry. A lot of candidates have a uh, misunderstanding that if we ask them if they shadow that we only mean optometry and uh, that's not the case. We think the only way you can learn who you want to be, quite frankly, when you grow up is by checking out different professions. So maybe you shadow the dentist, a pharmacist, uh, a primary care physician, or a specialist or veterinary. That's fine. Tell us about it. That tells us that you've done a critical analysis of what you want to do as a profession. Many candidates go to undergrad saying they're going to be a pre-med major. Uh, and if you're a quote, pre-med major, you know for a fact that that changes for, I would dare guess, at least half of those candidates. So uh, it's there's nothing wrong with shadowing in multiple professions and then deciding that optometry is the one that you uh, want to, to choose. Um, and then there's always uh, learning more about healthcare and the process. For example, when the previous administration uh, passed um, uh, what was commonly became known as Obamacare, uh, optometrists everywhere benefited from that legislation. Uh, optometry not being allowed to, to do certain things, to sit on certain government panels, all of that went away. So you always have to be uh, cognizant of what a legislature uh, state or federal it has in the in the works. Uh, there are now five states where you can perform uh, laser procedures as an optometrist, and there are many states, including Tennessee, who are considering that. And that is a um, a pretty big deal because it opens up another avenue for you as a healthcare provider uh, to offer services that previously were not uh, offered. So keep up with what's going on uh, locally, statewide, uh, and federally. Okay, there's the uh, everything else category, if you will. And one thing I'd like to uh, point out is we find that uh, people who worked 20 or more hours a week and those who were athletes often make really good students. And that's because they've had to juggle so much. When you come to optometry school, you're basically in classes or labs and clinic uh, eight to five. And some undergrads go to class eight to 12 and then do nothing the rest of the day. So quite frankly, it, it kind of makes you become a little lazier in many cases. Whereas if you work half a day and you're in class half a day, you're gonna be much more conscientious about your time management and you're probably going to get a lot more done. Um, is there a guarantee that if you work X number of hours, you'll get a seat and be successful? No, of course not. But it is a, there is a lot to do with time management skills that make you successful uh, as a student. And that's on any level. One thing I've learned is when you get to, to the professional school level, 30 minutes is 30 minutes. I think in undergrad, there's often a feeling of I only, I only have 30 minutes, so I'm not going to do X study. I'm not going to uh, run. I'm not going to uh, do some service, but you're missing out on a lot in those 30 minutes. You can accomplish a great deal uh, and, and you double that and go to an hour. Uh, there, there's tons you can accomplish. And it's, it's really the students here that have taught me that. And I give this example often, and it may sound a little uh, crude and rudimentary, but uh, I saw a, can, uh, a student sitting in the lobby once, and she had a huge key ring, I mean a big key ring, and she had made uh, flashcards, punched holes in them, and had them all around that ring and as she sat in our lobby waiting to go to a meeting she probably had no more than 10 or 15 minutes but she was reviewing those cards and it struck me that she had figured out how to manage her time that 10 or 15 minutes don't have to be spent on facebook 
or Twitter or some other electronic form. Uh, they can be fine tuning that concept you didn't understand in class. They can be helping out a fellow student or a fellow citizen. So don't ever overlook uh, time because we know students who have accomplished uh, so much that when a student tells us, quote, they didn't have time to shadow even though we recommended it two months ago. And then I know a candidate who works 40 hours a week, managed to shadow twice as much as the one who uh, doesn't work. The story just doesn't hold up. So always take advantage of your time. And if you start that practice now, you're gonna be a much better student uh, on the professional school level. This has become, uh, what you're seeing now, very important. We even have a policy now at SCO that says, if we offer you a seat, which is a tentative acceptance, and then you display unprofessional behavior after that, we can pull your offer. And when we say un uh, unprofessional behavior, it's, it's multi-pronged, quite frankly. Uh, one of the biggest things is uh, how you address uh, people in a uh, higher position, maybe I should say. For example, for me personally, uh, once students come here, once I get to know them as an applicant, I don't have any problem with them calling me by first name. But if I've never met you, I've never had any interaction with you, and the first thing you do is address me by my first name, it may throw me off a little bit. Uh, but not as much as that as when uh, someone with a demonstrated uh, doctorate, and you refer to that person by first name, you're really pushing a professionalism issue there. And we've had candidates who interviewed, referred to their interviewer by first name, who we've sent information via email from uh, a, a professor or an administrator, and it clearly indicates they have one or two doctorates and the candidate writes back using first name, it's just a lack of respect is what that is. And lack of respect is not going to do you any good because te let me tell you, we keep notes on everything. So if you have been unprofessional in communication or correspondence when you came to visit, when we went to visit you, we're probably gonna watch that very carefully and make a note of it. Um, the second thing is, and this is a pet peeve for me especially, is uh, don't email me and then in two minutes call me with the question that you email me or vice versa. Um, I'm pro I pride myself on the response time. In fact, everybody in this office does a fantastic job. I try to respond within 24 hours, and in many cases it's within 24 seconds, quite frankly. But there are times when I'm in meetings, there's times when I'm meeting with candidates, there's times when I'm out recruiting. So if I haven't responded in 24 hours, 48 hours, maybe after the 48, you can say, hey, I just wanted to check and see that you get my, my note. Uh, but emailing and calling within a matter of, of a few minutes, which happens very often, quite frankly, is, is really just rude is what it is. Uh, so be careful of that. Um, also, the other thing is you're going to be in a profession where you have to uh, critically analyze information and, and, and dig and research. So don't call us and say, hey, when does your application process begin when it's clearly plastered all over our web page? Um, sometimes we understand that a prerequisite question can be difficult. At the same time, don't call and say, here, I'm going to send you my transcript and I want you to tell me what prerequisites I'm missing. What you should do is say, I think I have the, trans the prerequisites covered, but I have a question about one or two in particular. Uh, that just shows us that you're taking care of, of your homework. And when you get in the classroom here, you're going to do the same thing. Um, it's just, I think we've become a generation of looking down at our phones and if we don't get Siri to answer us right away, or we can't punch it in within two minutes, then we, we can't find the answer until we're gonna call somebody and find out what the answer is. That's not the way it works. Um, so those are just some key things we think are important. 
The other thing is keeping up with your email. Uh, I send invitations uh, for interviews by email. I send tons of information by email. And I'm gonna give you a very solid and concrete example of a student not checking his email and it costing him literally $100,000. And it was a student who graduated a few years ago, loved him to death, great student, was a great candidate. But in order for him to receive money from the state that he was from, he had to fill out paperwork. And I emailed him numerous times, reminding him of the deadline until the point that the state contacted me and said, we can no longer wait. We are awarding this seat to someone else. He literally lost $100,000 in free money because he did not check his email. Uh, and we have students who do that here. That's the, the most extreme example, but uh, there have been other ones who've lost lesser amounts of money uh, because they didn't follow up and just simply click on an email account. So always check, check your spam. We know that information we send sometimes gets filtered. Um, often I will send two emails back to back and the candidate will let me know they got the second one, but they are confused because they didn't get the first one. And uh, nine times out of 10, that went to their spam for some reason. So just be aware uh, that communication is uh, being sent out and that you need to keep up with it. All right, so that brings us to the end of the presentation. Thanks to Mr. Robertson for all the information passed along. We will open it up for questions, so feel free to type into the question box anything that's on your mind. As you do that, I want to plug an upcoming event in October, which is the ASCO Virtual Fair. ASCO stands for the Association for Schools and Colleges of Optometry, and they do a lot in partnership with those 23 schools to get information out to you all about your options um, for optometry school, all the things you need to do to get there, so on and so forth. And the ASCO Virtual Fair is one of my favorite things. Basically, they invite can't not candidates, they invite representatives from all of the schools to come together in a virtual platform and answer your questions. So it's a chat room and you can see the transcript of all the other questions asked. Each school designates the chat hours they want to sit for. And so if they're there all day and a student pops on in the morning and asks a question. You log on in the afternoon, you can see that question in the response. So it's really helpful, even if you don't have your own questions, to read those that others have asked. And of course, you have all of the school representative, representatives there on the same day. You can really learn and get a lot out of that. So um, I'll be sending a follow up to this presentation and I'll be sure to include the link you need to register in advance of the virtual fair. It is on Thursday, October 17th is the date. So again, I will send more information out about that. Um, so I see a question that has come through. I'm going to read that out to Mr. Robertson. So um, the question is, is the OAT required, the OAT score required before you will extend an in invitation for interview or can you be invited for an interview prior to receiving the OAT score? No, you cannot be invited until we have a score. And the main reason is to protect you. Uh, let's just say you have a great GPA and uh, the thought would be, okay, uh, they're going to have a great uh, OAT score. And then the OAT score comes in later at a below acceptable number then you've already spent travel money to come here for an interview and we're gonna just turn around and ask you to retake the test. So if I have a score on file that is quote acceptable, and again, we talked about that meaning at least 300, uh, you are eligible for uh, the possibility of being invited for an interview. What we will do sometimes is if the candidate has at least a 300, they're retaking the test in the future. We may go ahead and invite him or her for an interview and then just simply await the new scores before we render a decision. 
everything is not always cut and dry and it, it, it puts me in a dilemma of whether to request a candidate to retake right away or not. So I will tell them up front, hey, we're going to invite you for an interview, but we may turn around and ask uh, for uh, a retake of that test. So the initial uh, uh, interview uh, cannot come until we have an OAT score on file. Another question. How soon should I look for optometry scholarships before applying to optometry school? Well, you can always start that process. You know, there's, it's really, to me, a little, uh, people always say, look for outside scholarships. Well, I'm going to tell you that too, but in all reality, there are not a lot of, quote, outside scholarships. Outside scholarships are generally going to come from um, a company your parents work for and they say, hey, we, we have, you know, for anybody who works here, their children can apply for a certain scholarship. There's uh, optometric associations and foundations. Uh, we used to get one from Kansas all the time and they would uh, uh, give, you know, it wasn't a big amount of money, $1,000, $500, whatever. Um, so there's not tons of scholarship information or scholarships available in the pre-admission process. Uh, luckily, uh, through SCO, we award more scholarships than any optometry school in the country. I think last year were about 70 students. Almost half of our students got some form of scholarship, and those range from 1000 a year to 20000 a year, and they are renewable every year. So uh, we give out a lot, but nobody can get one until they've been offered a seat. This question says, I'm planning to take the OAT in December of 2019 and hoping to be admitted for the class of 2020. Is this cutting it too close? It's not necessarily cutting it too close if you do a couple of things. One, get your application into OptomCast finished and verified before you take the test. That way, again, all you've got to do is send me a copy of the test scores. What I tell most candidates is if you can take the test by January 15th, you've got a pretty good chance of, of being considered for 2020. If you take the test on March 1st, the last day, it's going to be really difficult. And again, that January 15th goes back to the rest of your file being complete and ready to go. Um, the one thing you have to keep in mind is uh, our deadline for the OAT is indeed March 1. If you take the OAT on December the 2nd, it is impossible for you to retake the test prior to our deadline because there's a 90-day waiting period in between tests. So by taking the test after December 1, as long as you understand it's an all-or-none situation, in other words, if that test score comes back non-competitive, you're going to be waiting until the next cycle uh, to apply. And there's nothing wrong with that. We don't hold it against anyone for reapplying. I literally just invited a girl today, uh, a young lady who uh, didn't make it in last year, but she retook the test, uh, much, performed much better, and we're inviting her back. So there's nothing wrong with the reapplication. It's just you need to understand that you're you're going to be limited uh, by taking it after December 1. This question says, does it matter where we completed our undergraduate degree? Does one university mean more? No, uh, despite what Rebecca and I think about our alma maters having the best candidates on earth, um, it, it, it really doesn't. The, the only time I think it comes into play is when it's um, a really really well-renowned academic institution. So you're getting into the Ivy League, you're getting into the Stanfords, um, the Universities of Chicago, et cetera. Um, and in those cases, it can make a difference in that, uh, you know, a 3.0 from uh, the University of Pennsylvania might be in, a little better than a 3.0 from your general state university. But is that candidate going to get some major advantage? Not really, because 
the OAT, that's the great thing about a standardized test. It becomes an equalizer. So it, it, it looks at everybody and says, okay, you went to State University A, you went to State University B, you went to a private school, you went to a small liberal arts school, go take the same test, all four of you, and let's see how you perform on that test. So the OAT always gives you a chance to equalize uh, the playing field. And quite frankly, we don't get a lot of uh, Ivy League applications or Stanford applications, et cetera. Certainly there are schools we know that are better than others, but again, we're gonna rely on that OAT. This question says, is it better idea to take the OAT while currently enrolled in a few prerequisite courses like physics, organic chemistry, et cetera, so that you can retake if need be, or is it better to take it once all prereqs are completed and potentially miss out on the opportunity to retake it? So sounding like a December OAT. Right. Uh, I think um, that sometimes that's, that's difficult, but I think it's very difficult, A, to juggle classwork and test prep. So if you're in the middle of a semester taking physics and whatever, organic or whatever, it's kind of hard to prepare for the test and prepare for the class equally. And more than likely, one of the two is going to suffer. So for example, let's say we have somebody who takes the OAT on uh, September the 15th. Well, technically, they're going to be eligible to retake on December the 15th, but I'm going to contact that person and say, wait until January the 15th, because if they're in school, they can get through the semester, get through exams, and most undergrads now get three to four weeks of, of uh, a break at winter. So I'm going to suggest that you wait and take the test close further along, because that gives you more time to prepare. There are uh, some thoughts out there that taking the test very soon after you completed organic or physics, that it will help your uh, score. And I have no hardcore research to show that. Anecdotally, I have noticed it. I've noticed that candidates who finished organic, say in the spring, then took the OAT, it seems like they make uh, a stronger score uh, in the organic section because it's so familiar. And, and speaking of that, one thing, you, a couple of things you got to remember is the biology section is going to go all the way back to your freshman level biology courses. So don't think because you took anatomy and physiology and genetics and you did really well that you're going to do well on biology. You have to go all the way back to biology one and two and ecology type questions. They're not going to just ask you about uh, healthcare necessarily. So, and the other thing is physics. Uh, physics is the lowest score nationally on the OAT, and you might make an A in both courses and make a sub 300 on that, so don't be shocked. Um, but the bottom line is, if your major is chemistry, don't overlook the chemistry. If your major is biology, don't overlook the biology. Uh, you always have to go back and do prep work. This question asks, I have prior classes unrelated to my current major and the SEO prerequisites that have lowered my GPA. Is this taken into consideration when you look at the GPA of an applicant? I have prior classes unrelated to my current major and the SEO prerequisites that have lowered my GPA. Well, we're going to look at everything. You know, that's one thing that's for sure. We're going to check uh, prerequisites, non-prerequisites, et cetera. So it, it really is going to come down to a bottom line of what does that cumulative GPA come back to. And for OptomCast, they're going to count, if you repeat a course and it's the same exact course that you had uh, in uh, the first attempt. So in other words, you're at State College X and you took physics 101, you made an F, you repeat it, same school, same course number, they're going to forgive that F. Uh, but if you go to another school and take it, they're going to calculate both of those in there. So sometimes it, it's hard to say without looking at a calculation of the cumulative GPA. Um, but uh, if you get to an individualized question like that, 
that's one of those we go back to where we said ask questions and contact us and we can give you a, a more definitive answer. So another uh, related question might be how do we look at cumulative GPA versus prerequisite GPA? We give, um, it's hard to say we give more credence to one versus the other, but my thought is the cumulative is more uh, the one we look at harder but you can't look at anything again in a vacuum you have to consider both uh, i do know that let's say a candidate has a 3.0 overall but their cumulative is higher it's a i mean their prerequisite is higher and it's a three four or five we think that's a good thing um, if the prerequisite is lower is it necessarily bad it just depends on what the variance is between the two but Yes, a prerequisite GPA that is higher than the cumulative uh, can be, uh, be something we uh, take into consideration as a, quote, good thing. And remember, we're going to see multiple GPA calculations for you. We're going to see a math GPA, a science GPA, uh, a chemistry GPA, a freshman year GPA, a sophomore year GPA. And so we, we look at a lot of them. And along those lines, I will tell you that the, the junior and senior GPAs are considered much more than the freshman and sophomore. Sometimes you see a candidate who just was not ready for undergrad, perform poorly in his or her first year, but then they righted the ship and did really well junior and senior year. Well, that's a good thing. Their GPA still may not be great overall, but the junior and senior GPA are good and so we're going to give that a, a lot of credibility. All right, another question. Um, I'm a freshman in college now. Is it too early to begin studying for the OAT? I'm eager to get started. I'm majoring in biology because I love biology and I heard that the OAT is bio heavy. Do you have any thoughts on this? Well, when you say study for the OAT, I don't know that it's, you know, you should do some hardcore studying because I think you'll burn yourself out. But I do think you can get, for example, an OAT study guide, or you can get, go online, um, ASCO has some OAT preparation material, and start to see what the content is uh, for the questions. And that way, you know, when you're in a course or you get to the uh, you get to a choice. Do I take general physics or intro to physics? Well, to us it doesn't matter, but that's because every school is different. But you can look at the OAT guide and say, well, you know, it looks like they're really asking more questions from the general physics course at my institution, so I'm going to take the general physics. Um, but as far as, as, as really starting to prep for the test, I don't think it, it's uh, advisable to do too much. Again, I just worry about burnout. Uh, but keeping up with what types of questions, that type of studying and that type of preparation is good. But if you're going to take the test between your junior and senior year, um, I'm thinking into that junior year is where you really start the preparation. Okay, any other last minute questions out there? You are very welcome at any point in time to reach out to the admissions office here at SCO. I put our standard admissions email there. You can find all of our individual contact information on our website. So please give that a look. Don't hesitate to reach out. We have a full roster of webinars scheduled for this year. We have some really great sessions coming up. So take a look at that on our website as well. I hope you join us at the ASCO virtual fair. And um, since it doesn't look like we have any other questions, we're going to wrap it up. So thank you all for being here. Hope you have a great afternoon.